something. I have here also, I'm going to get another split. So I think this is, oh, it's definitely one, two, that's why. We're going to also do views of England. All right, because it's all going to, it will be in this, in both in, in the 17th century that you will find Jews moving to both of these countries. And they're, we're talking primarily, certainly in England, it's Spanish Portuguese Jews, Holland, Spanish Portuguese, plus we had learned last time that German Jews, because times were so difficult there. I think the majority went eastward, more to Poland, Lithuania, but some did go westward. And I'm sure there are Jews trickling into France, again, as conversos, they could not, they were expelled in 1394 and they cannot officially live in France, but I am sure that they're trickling back, but again, as conversos. Um, and there are obviously a few, yes, 1290 from England and 1394 from France and 1492 from Spain, and then also, well, they were officially expelled from Portugal, but they really uh, were forcibly converted and they remained there until they could eventually get their way out. Um, and I always really want to stress the fact, you know, I want to kind of show them that the, most of those Jews who will ultimately return to Judaism, they are the Portuguese Jews. The ones in Spain, they were okay with the idea of living as they were. But those who had gone to Portugal in 1492, they wanted to live openly as Jews. And then I told you they were caught up and, you know, and had to be forcibly converted by the evil king. But they always wanted to live open lives as Jews. And those are the ones who remain Jewish. You know? Whereas those in Spain over, you know, the decades and the centuries, they just, they, they didn't know anything anymore. They just drifted away. Maybe they had two. Uh, that would link them, you know, to so those Jews who will find their way now to Western Europe and eventually to the Americas, they're really they are Portuguese, those Portuguese, those who had fled Spain, 1492, went to Portugal and they staying on there. Hello, how are you? <laughs> okay. Oh, who is this gentleman? Oh, well, he's giving a meeting in there. Oh. I do the Dutch on my own, so that's right. <laughs> and, but I read it in the English part. I, I so, you know, and I, it's hard enough just understanding it in the English. So I, I'm more than happy to do it that way. Okay, so let, let's go on. So we learned that the Jews first will start going to live in uh, Holland around that year 1600, uh, the zenith of, of of Dutch, whoa, thank you, of Dutch um, Jewish history will be, you know, later in like mid, mid to late 17th century, uh, that was their heyday. And just because it was the heyday for for the general population, Holland and the Jews benefited it by it. Also, and I said, Holland had been a Catholic country, then they were influenced, they'd be, most of the people decided to become Protestant Calvinists. Uh, they hated, uh, they were being ruled over by the Holy Roman Emperor, who's also the King of Spain. So it was a Spanish influence there. And uh, they overthrew them finally in the year 1588. That's called William of Orange, uh, who, was, who led them. I mean, it was, it was a long struggle, it lasted for many, many years. But finally, 1588 got rid of the Spanish influence. And now they were an independent Dutch Republic. And again, they're freely practicing their Protestant uh, Calvinistic uh, religion. And it is at that point, they were interested in just, you know, becoming wealthier, expanding their trade route. Uh, um, they set up colonies both in the Americas and, you know, in the Indies, all, all the way like this. Uh, we're talking about uh, the, uh, East Asia, that area. Um, and so they welcomed the Jews. They were more than happy. They wanted to become a very, as prosperous as they possibly could. They had certainly nothing per se against the Jews. And so they welcomed them in and they followed with them. Then we talked about the fact that a lot of these Jews were somewhat conflicted because they've been living 
Now, for if we're talking about the 1497 into the 1600s, they've been living openly as Catholics for you know 150 years. Some of them, so their level of Jewish education was quite low and poor, and they didn't always remember everything about halakhically and you know, how to, to do everything. So we did learn, like that there was a few individuals, particularly Baruch Spinoza, who was so famous, you know, who left their you know, Jewish traditions. And he did not become a Christian, uh, but he definitely left Judaism and communicated. And he was very like revered and honored in the general world of philosophy, you know, uh, but in, in, in Jewish circles, he was not. Or certainly religious Jews, so I don't know, you know, how conservative reform Jews might be, but, you know, he in a very negative manner. Uh, but eventually, you know, they set up their own schools, and then they had their own rabbanim, and they were their So now we're up to that part. I'm on page four of the, with the thing I had given you originally, the Jews of Holland, and we're going to talk about different Jewish religious leaders. And then at a certain point, I'm going to switch for a while to the Jews of England, and you'll see how the two communities, you know, will have a connection. Okay, the first individual at the very end of page four, his name is Rabbi Yitzchak Uziel. Um, you can see he's one of the earlier leaders, obviously, 1550 to 1622. Um, Rabbi Yitzchak's family traces genealogy back to a distinguished Spanish family many members of which have put Spain in 1492. Now these, that particular, remember, they went in many different directions. I would say the majority went to Portugal, just because it was the family the Iberian Peninsula, and it was easier for them. They didn't have to travel quite as far, but some would have gone to North Africa, but life was very difficult. For them. They had as many chose to go to North Africa, and many went to Italy, and then they, for, they, then they would have traveled about all the way to the Ottoman Empire because the caliph invite, you know, invited them to settle in, in the Ottoman lands. And then the Ottoman lands also included with Israel. And that's where we have a very vibrant Jewish community in Eretz Israel. We're talking about more like 15th, 16th, 16th century, but the 17th century is a really fine. So the century prior to where we are right now. Okay. Um, Okay, they initially fled to Fez in Morocco, and Rabbi Yisrael then in turn he flees Fez in 1605 because there was a famine there. Life was very, very difficult. Back to North, so they attacked upon the Jews there and became the rabbi of Iran, Algeria. Interesting. And 16, because originally the largest Jewish community in North Africa would have been Morocco, but then it's going to spread to Algeria and eventually even to Tunisia. Right. Um, 1606, he traveled to Amsterdam, where he taught and also occupied himself with business. One of his pupils was Rabbi Menashe Ben Israel. We're going to learn a lot more about him. Uh, Rabbi Yisrael was then instrumental in the formation of one of the first Portuguese congregations in, come out in Amsterdam, Neve Shalom, in the year 1608. When the first rabbi of the congregation resigned in 1610, who knows <laughs> what the reason was, Rabbi Yisrael was chosen to be his successor. He had a profound influence on the community of newly professed Jews, most of whom had been born in Christians. As I told you, there was a tremendous conflict uh, you know, within the more recently returned Jews. Um, Many of them still live under subtle Christian influences. I mean, I guess it's just natural, you know, that, I mean, if, if you, your, your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, you know, you were following those things. Through that. And how much, how long can you keep on doing it secretly? You know, so, right. And you're, and you're certainly getting minimal ed education in any way. Um, and your life, we were in danger. You, you really you couldn't do it openly. Uh, Rabbi Yissa was steadfast and outspoken in his of these negative influences, and this made him unpopular and some circle. I mean, nobody wants to be told that you're doing things. <laughs> in 1618, some of the congregants broke off from the Neve Shalom and formed another congregant. We'll learn eventually there were, there were several, several. Remember, we told you that even among these Spartan Jews, they each had a little niche 
you know, we're not talking about a lot of people. We're talking about maybe in the hundreds. Eventually, it will be a, a number of thousands. But you know, these are not like we're talking about the Jews of Poland and Slovenia. Yes, we are talking about hundreds of thousands of people ultimately. Rabbi Yisro wrote a Hebrew grammar work, 1627, and he was also considered to be able poet. And I also uh, read in one source that he was a professional musician. I thought that was so interesting. Here's another interesting uh, love. His name is Rabbi Abraham Herrera uh, from 1570 to 1630. But you can, you can figure out who are, uh, to this day, those people who are original Spanish Portuguese Jews by their last name. They are all Spanish Port Portuguese boundary. Uh, for example, like my, my son used to be uh, in, he was he had called the educational director in Shagrid, Israel. So that's the Spanish Portuguese show in, in um, England, in New York City. Uh, and I have no idea how many members of them are there, but he said maybe five <laughs> that could trace themselves back all the way, right? Or, or you know, among the founding, you know, people, you know, of the congregation. And again, you could tell by their themes you know, that they had those. But there were other people then eventually obviously came and several of them became members of that show, but there were like five families who said they were going for back hundreds of years. Okay, let's see with Rabbi Herrera. He was born into an influential family of conversos who retained high government positions in Spain. The family was able to emigrate from Spain and to settle in Italy. I mean, if you wanted to remain as a Jew, you had to leave. Spain. There was no choice, and, and obviously in Portugal also. Rabbi Abraham was a successful businessman. It's interesting how they, they all had to engage in business. Well, maybe this was also a way for them to leave the country, right? Because they had business dealings, so they traveled elsewhere. Oh, it's a living, right. Yes, yes. Right, it should come from an in independent. So you would, well, that way you would retain your independent character because if you want to depend, although I already remember when we had learned about, I think I was already starting to, uh, the Jews of, from Germany, uh, already there had been discussion about, I mean, they eventually came to the realization that people, you, you couldn't devote your proper energy to taking care of, of, of your synagogue, your, your community, and, unless you received income from that community, you know, and then you know, they did come around to thinking, yes, it's okay to pay the rabbi, and then that would be his sole source of income. But right, many, certainly in the Gemara, right, those Rabbana, they all were somehow engaged in different kinds of, some of them were actually quite wealthy from it. Okay, uh, he also devoted himself to the study of religious philosophy and Kabbalah. Rabbi Avron's far-flung different Activities brought him to Ragusa. I never knew this was the original language, which is now Dubrovnik. I've never been there, but it's, you know, it's beautiful. It's off of uh, the Adriatic Sea in Yugoslavia. Well, it used to be Yugoslavia. And it's really, for people, if you ever seen pictures from cruise ships, stunning, stunning Dubrovnik. Yeah. Uh, and there he met a Rabbi Yisrael Saruk, one of the foremost disciples of the Ari. Now, you said they already had leanings toward Kabbalah, so obviously. Been attracted to this other rub. He became Rav Yisrael's avid disciple and eventually came to be considered an adept Kabbalist himself. He continued his business career and was sent to Cadiz, Spain, as a mercantile emissary of the Sultan of Morocco. While he was in Cadiz, the city was taken over by the English. Isn't it funny how things work out in life? In the year 1596, Rabbi Avraham was captured and held as a hostage in or near London. His captors insisted that he was a Spanish subject. Rabbi Avraham was not seen before the summer of 1599, so several years he was held in prison. Soon after, Rabbi Avraham moved to Amsterdam, same sort of over there, where conversos were then beginning to settle in significant numbers. The liberal government of Holland permitted them to openly practice their religion. This is just of all the countries of Europe, the most tolerant is Holland. Uh, Rabbi Abba remained there for the rest of his life. Finally, he's had some peace. I mean, look how he's been moving around from country to country. 
While Nancy and Rabbi Avram wrote two Kabbalistic works in Spanish and set aside a sum of money for their translation into Hebrew upon his death. I thought that was uh, great. Well, obviously, he realized if once it's in Hebrew, it can then go to Jewish communities wherever they are throughout the world. Um, these works were entitled to our I think I meant to write Hashemayim. That's okay, Yud. It might be it is, but with an underline. Bottom part. Okay, Shah Hashemayim and Beit Elohim, and they were published in Hebrew in 1655. Segments of these Sfarim were also, now this is so interesting, were also translated into Latin by Christian intellectuals interested in the Kabbalah. You remember when we studied about the Jews of Italy, we learned also so many works that were studied by Christian, you know, Latin scholars. Rabbi Avram was held in high regard by the Sephardic community of Amsterdam and Rabbi Menasha ben Yisrael, who, who's the most famous rabbi from this time period, even sought his recommendation, his hasgama, to one of his works. You know, like you have a, a forward, a way to sell a book, you know, somebody writes this lovely phrase of the book, so then that's why you, know, you, you will be more apt to purchase. All right. Now we're going to go about Rabbi Menashe ben Yisrael, but because he's so closely associated with the Jews of England, and I think we'll pause here. So then every, well, I could read a little, but then I'm going to stop at the part where it has to do with England. Okay, so let's talk about it. He, so he's already, he's fully in the 17th century, 1604 to 1657. He was born at Canberra, so in Portugal, right? I told you where most of them come from. Rabbi Benazza was taken while yet an infant to Amsterdam. So really, he has no real knowledge uh, of Portugal. His entire life is going to be in Amsterdam. Rabbi Benazza's father had been accused of Judaizing by the Inquisition. I'm sure it was true. <laughs> he was. But managed to escape being burned at the stake in an auto de fe. After a short stay in France, he finally settled in Amsterdam, where the family openly returned to Judaism and took the family name Ben Yisrael. So I don't know what his actual first name, last name was, but that's how he has the name. I am one of you. In Amsterdam, Rabbi Menasseh received a thorough Talmudic education and had the good fortune to study under Amsterdam prior, Rabbi Yitzchak Uziel. Two years after Rabbi Uziel's death, which was in the year 1620, the 18 year old Manasseh was proclaimed his successor as rabbi of the Sephardic community in the Vey Shalom. Isn't that amazing? What a, what a brilliant young man he was. I and mean, Alvin was a tremendous impression. In addition to his Jewish education, Rabbi Manasseh had received a comprehensive secular education. He, it's so interesting. The Jews of Western Europe, they're, they're, they've never been afraid of. of Secular education, it's, uh, it's just the Jews from Poland and Romania. They had wanted nothing to do with that, and they would stress only you know, the Jewish aspect of one's education. Um, okay. Uh, okay, he was fluent in 10 languages, was pretty good, and had great knowledge in many disciplines, especially, and this we find common throughout from the medieval period on, uh, medicine, mathematics, and astronomy. He was also well read in classical literature, right? If you if you have a good secular education, definitely included study of Greek and Latin writings, and in the writings of early Christian theologians. So again, see here, look at this. See that he wasn't afraid to study this. He wasn't afraid that it was going to sway him from his Judaism. He just wanted to learn about many different disciplines. His wide-ranging interests encompass the full spectrum of Jewish learning and thinking. His understanding of Jewish trends of thought ranged from the rationalist school, the Rambam, to the writings of later Kabbalists. Or the Ramban which is a Kabbalist, but the Rambam is definitely not. He also had a great proficiency in Hebrew language and grammar. And we always find people starting, even from the, in the Gaonic period, people who stress the point of dick duck. So, those of you, who, if you had a, a, a Jewish education, you know, it's it, 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 a very big part of Hebrew. Rabbi Benatis' fame as a scholar. Okay, so this is where we're going to stop. Okay, because that's going to lead us into the Jews. So, look at that. I see. 
Ireland, about the Jews of England, also 17th century. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. yes. Um, now, again, the Jews are officially expelled from England in the year 1290. Remember the first um, blood libel case was in England, you know. Uh, and because it's still in England and Ireland, so it wasn't like these people could have easily traveled back and forth. Now, there obviously had to have been some Jews there because I remember reading and learning that Queen Elizabeth, so she's in the 1500s, a 16th century, uh, her physician was a Jew. Again, he was a converso, it's what everyone called him, the Jew. <laughs> you know, so you, know, you, you couldn't really escape, you know, your origins. Uh, so there definitely were other Jews living here, but again, you you would not ever have openly have practiced your, your Judaism. Um, obviously, it's England, the Church of England, uh, that, that you, where you would have gone to do what you were saying. Um, and a lot of them were, were then engaged in commerce, you know, merchants, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, England officially had no Jews in the first gold in 1290, but after 1492, a number of conversos gradually ventured onto the island. However, they would never were sufficiently comfortable to practice Judaism openly. During the reign of Elizabeth I, a Spanish converso was a suspect of having plotted against the queen's life so as to make it, oh, I mean, this, 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 um, you know, libel against the Jews. Why, why did it come? Because, ah, uh, so as, I mean, this sentence doesn't make sense, but <laughs> I'm going to wig it on my way here. So as to make it easier for Spain to conquer England. Now, to come up with a terrorist, a reason to, to, oh, well, it was this Jew, this Spaniard, you know, and you know how the, the British, you know, remember the Spanish Armada? I mean, the, the, the British, you know, uh, or English, they weren't not Great Britain yet. In, English hated Spain, and, you know, there was always controversy between uh, the two of them. Um, okay. Uh, oh, my left foot. Fort and the Conversos was executed, although he was quite innocent. Okay. And as I say, I do remember learning, as I say, that her position was a Jew. Right. And obviously, it had been a, a uh, you know Spanish Portuguese or just Portuguese Jew. In the 16th century, Henry VIII, lovely man, bro England broke with the Catholic Church. So again, we're going to have another Protestant country. It's not the Catholic countries that are going to welcome in the Jews. It was ultimately Protestant countries, thereby removing one possible source of the readmittance of Jews to England. I think it is important. You, you'll see. In addition, two factors drew the attention of the English to the desirability of letting Jews settle among them. One was the obvious economic advantage, all right, that would make sense, again, because they were merchants, all right, uh, while the presence, which the presence of Jews had brought to Holland, all right. Um, they, they knew about the, the Jews had been, who had been admitted and were living openly as Jews in Holland, Again, this is the age of exploration, and the, you know how they they recognize and see how, how very much Jews are, are involved with this. And so they figured they were also becoming very mercantile, you know, expansionist, you know, settling colonies all over the world. And they so they wanted to take advantage of whatever connections the Jews themselves might have. Ah, and this actually was the religious argument advanced by the Nazis and Israel. So I want to pause because I want to tell you something about English history. Okay. Now you know the current king of England, Charles the Third, but there was obviously a Charles the and Charles the Second, and that's all come into play for the history of the Jews at this time. Um, so we'll start with Charles the First. Okay. Uh, very much disliked by a large portion of the people in England. And he did not get along with Parliament at all. And um, they did, they, they, wanted, they wanted to make more like a constitutional government, you know, which they have today. I mean, that's basically the way it is. 
but he, he refused to give up. You know, he thought the divine right of kings, and he, you know, uh, that that nobody could remove him from office or give up any rights because right, God is one who, who you know has appointed him to be king over England, uh, and you know, Parliament was trying to exercise you know his powers. And uh, eventually, uh, he is arrested, Charles I, thrown into prison, and he still refuses to cooperate, to give up anything, and he is beheaded. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't just think of Henry VIII and all those wise events of us. <laughs> Here's the king one loses his head. Now, oh, this one thing I, I learned so the, there was a period of civil war. In England, and the the main proponents of it were Cavaliers. The Cavaliers would have been people loyal to King the Royalists. Cavaliers, they were called Cavaliers with long flowing locks. I don't know if they're real hair or if they're wigs, but you know, with the paintings and that kind of thing, that's what they look like. And those on the other side, those who who wanted Parliament to have more power, those they're called Roundheads because they didn't have those. <laughs> locks of hair. So if you ever hear these words, you know, it's, it's from this time period. And we're talking about right this same thing. This is 16th century England. All right. Um, so again, we, Charles I is now beheaded. Who's going to be who okay? Well, we don't have a monarchy anymore. So oh wait, and his son, also Charles, you know, we, we went into exile. So Meanwhile, who rises to power? The arm, army plays a very important role. It's Oliver Cromwell. Okay, so I'm sure you've heard of him. Um, and Oliver Cromwell rules. Let me see if I can get it. He's called the Lord Protector. That was his title. Um, let me see what I can say here. I just don't know. So Charles I, right, he dies and he had it in the year 1649. Um, okay. Um, there are, the parliament goes through different phases. It's called a rump parliament, somewhat you know, smaller than the king. They, they, during Cromwell's time, they, they abolished the House of Lords. So it's only, you know, the House of Commons. Then, they, then there's another parliament called the Bare Bones Parliament. Right, they go through different things. Also, I, I learned that during this time period, and under Cromwell's rule, remember, he is a military man, that um, he uh, he actually don't forget uh, Ireland was part of, of this greater uh, England. It's Scotland. I'm talking about Wales, but talking about Scotland and Ireland. Uh, but Ireland is kind of a Catholic country, so uh, and Cromwell is a Puritan. So we talk about a Puritan in America. So just think that he's a Puritan uh, and. Um, he, he apparently he had uh, numerous uh, battles in Ireland and treated the people very harshly. And it's from this time period that the British started taking over land in Ireland. Remember, it, it, it even come closer to into the 19th, 20th century. And you talk about Irish powers, how they hated the British because the British had, had come in and taken over their lands. And that's how the people were so poor. And then in the 19th century, you had the Potato famine, but but it's all sort of starting from, you know. I, I mean, I think the Irish always hated the English, you know, and part of it was a religious reason. But now they're hating them also because they've lost any control of their country because so much of it is now owned you know, by these huge states that the the British have about have established. Um, okay, it's really interesting, you know. I'm sure, you learn, we learn different things, and and that's a Pull the whole thing together. Now to tie it into Jewish history, I, I find that quite interesting. Let me just see if there's anything else I want to tell you. Uh, so I talked about Charles and when he is headed. Okay, from not immediately, but eventually, from all will become the head and call him our protector. And again, so now it's a Puritan right, not country. Um, we talked about that. They're being called round heads. Okay, um, I want to talk about the restoration quite yet. Um, 
Maybe I have the day where it was Cromwell. That's what I'm looking for. Where did I write that down? Here. Ah, so Cromwell um, was the Lord Protector from 1653 to 1658. And he dies. He dies naturally. He's not killed or anything. Um, there's then going to be a two year period. But he's not a very strong leader. So, you know, uh, there's this inter period of two years. And then they bring back, they, they decide to, to bring back Charles II from exile. And he now becomes the next king of England. And that period is called the Restoration. I want to, um, when I was first starting to learn all about this, I there's a member of our show who comes from England. So I said something to him about the restoration. They don't know what I was talking about. <laughs> you know who I asked my, my son's wife, uh, Andrew, you know, she's been living in England for 15 years already and she loves, you know, the English history. So she really knows, you know, this. whenever I said to her, when I said to her, well, what's about the restoration? She knew right away, Charles II. <laughs> so, so again, he, and we're, we're bringing back still a Protestant king, but a lot of them, this is the, this is the Stuarts, starts with James I. Queen Elizabeth dies, that's the first Queen Elizabeth. She has no heirs. So then James the first, who that would be the, you know, before that it's the Tudors, and now it's going to be the Stuarts. All right, so it's James the first, Charles the first, Charles the second, James the second, whatever. So, you know, um, we go into that. Okay, so I think I, I told you a little bit all about the history, but it's during Oliver. Cromwell's reign that the Jews will finally be able to live their lives in England openly as Jews. So we have to thank him. He he's you know he's a mixed figure in in British history. Um, uh, some of them will praise him tremendously for trying to clamp down on the power of the monarchy. Um, on the other hand, you know he he's also criticized those who love you know. The royalty and you know for having created you know all the chaos in the country for those in about let's say about 10 years all right that, that it was, although he didn't officially rule that long but he was um apparently he was a military man and that's how he got got his power through the army and he headed the army okay i think i told you everything that i wanted to tell you about this very important there's plenty more but you know I just wanted to give you the face. So how is okay? So now, why is it on the Cromwell side that the Jews are eventually going to be permitted to openly, but not legally? So it's still by law. You know, there was that expulsion in 1290. It's still, so to speak, on the books. But from Cromwell's time, I doesn't care anymore. It was a right for Jews to live there and live openly. So let's just read a little bit more about that here and here. Uh, and we'll explain how this all came to be. And that's how my son Sean and Shaw that, you know, that it's Mark. It all comes from this time period, the Cromwell time. Okay. Uh, oh, so in that third paragraph, where it says Jews of England, at that time, Oliver Cromwell ruled over England. England and Holland were then rivals for overseas trade, as you know, we as mentioned last time, you know, you know that originally, um, Dutch were the ones who settled in the United, well, what became the United States. But then the English came in, they they took over. <laughs> and that's how we had this you know, close relationship, obviously, with England. It seemed to Cromwell that the Jews had done a great deal to make Holland it's as powerful as it was. In 1652, Cromwell, all right, so this will now make the guess here. Invited an author to talk to the panel for the purpose of discussing the possibility of reopening England to Jewish citizens. Menashe did not arrive to the year 1655. Um, so let's read the next paragraph and then we'll go back to Menashe and Israel. Powerful as Cromwell was in the country, he did not dare make a favorable decision all by himself. Listen, you can imagine there's still a lot of anti Semitic feeling, you know, in the country, um, or towards just everyone else in the world. Um, and it wasn't like, and again, he didn't claim to be ruled by divine right. So, you know, it's one of like you could make a promulgation and say, well, I now allow all the Jews to come in. 
country. So we have to tread very carefully. Years, even before Menashe Ben Israel entered his plea for it, um, it became intensified after 1650 when pamphlets by the hundreds were devoted to the subject. So interesting, right? That it became, you know, real major point of discussion among many, many British citizens. Those opposed to the remission raked up all the arguments against the Jews that they could think of in bad manners and the danger of their turning St. Paul's Cathedral into a synagogue. I can't even believe that. And those in, it, it's huge, St. Paul's. I, I, I walk by it one time. Uh, actually, twice. You can't help me see it. I mean, it's got a big dome. <laughs> so, you know, it, it glistens. I just like, right, the dome you know, with a rock in the English Alliance. Those in favor of readmission denied some of the charges and refuted others. They pointed out that countries like Holland and Turkey, which had Jewish populations, had made rapid economic progress. They also asserted that the opposition came from certain merchants who feared Jewish competition. I'm sure that, that was a major reason why they didn't want them. Jews, they said, were kindly people, hardworking and clever. These public and private debates reached their Climax at the time of Menashe's uh, arrival. Yeah, I went had a discussion with Shalom. He feels that, you know, a lot of Jewish history books would give more credence to, to the mission of Rabbi Menashe Ben Israel, you know, and what he, you know, attempted to do for the, the Jews of England. But I guess from the perspective of British Jewry, I, I mean, not that they, they did do a book, definitely a appreciated his efforts on their behalf, but it's sort of what they did on their own to, to make themselves accessible. It was actually a case brought, I remember, uh, I think it was uh, Cecil Roth, I he was a former story, he's British, was no longer living. Uh, and he wrote a book about the history of Jews in England. I don't know if that's what he said. Um, I, I remember the son of, so I was reading it when I was visiting him, that it all started from the fact that there was a Jew living in London at the time, who really was Portuguese. And then he was accused of some charges and, you know, uh, uh, you know, because he was what they called Spanish, you know, and I pulled together the British and the Spanish that hated each other, the English are said English and the Spanish. So he was arrested and you know, they wanted to put him to death and he said, no, no, I'm not Spanish, I'm Portuguese. So that, that, that's where that, all, that comes from, that they identify the world as Portuguese Jews and eventually, you know, you know, whatever they were charging him, you know, everything was dropped and, and he was able. So they, they feel like it's from that time period, you know, right. And, and, and he was obviously openly proclaiming that he was a Jew, right, from Portugal, that, that Jews eventually were allowed. But again, this is not on the books. It's not legal. Okay, yet. That won't be till the 19th century. Can you imagine the 19th century? That's when Jews are finally granted British citizenship. But they are living there, and they're living there openly as Jews, but they can't vote. You know, they, they can't hold a, a, any positions like that. Um, yeah, isn't it amazing? Well, for 600, you have to figure with. But so this is in the early 1650s, 1750s, so 200 years. They're, allowed, they're living there. No one's throwing them out, but they officially, you know, are not citizens until right there. Uh, 1850. I think if it, it's uh, it was Nathaniel uh, Rothschild, I think. I'm trying to remember. They, because they, and they could never be members of parliament, but if you had to swear on the Christian Bible and they won a lot of, you know, Jewish Bible. Whatever. Um, so let's finish up the thing about, you know, England, and then we'll I'll go back to Rabbi Benashi Ben Israel. Um, okay. So I'm on that on the second page, you know, the first paragraph. Cromwell now called a national conference to discuss the matter. The lawyers present agreed that there was no real legal obstacle to the settlement of the Jews. Therefore, no new law specifically permitting the Jews to was necessary. 
actually Shalom says in retrospect it's probably just as well you know to because otherwise claims could have been brought against them this way they're living there you know they eventually were accepted as to advisability of letting them return the conference could come to no decision it had become obvious that there was more politics than sincerity in the whole discussion. Again, anybody would have considered these Jews as sort of the merchants, you know, who would have been, uh, you know, a threat to, to their economic you know, welfare, you know, that did not want the Jews. It become obvious it was more in politics. Those secretly opposed to Krama were using the excursion. Consequently, Krama decided it would be wiser to dismiss the conference. You know, he didn't want to press it, you know. Listen, he, you know, and Harlan at the time were responsible for, for beheading the prior king, you know, so his position as head of the country is somewhat tenuous. He's not going to make this Jewish issue be another thing of protest against it. All right, so he just drops it. Uh, the most heated, the mostly heated debate during Cromwell's time ultimately proved to be mostly talk. I told you, you know, Shaw tells me that it, it was actually in retrospect, was for the best that, that that's what happened. Already by 1655, a number of Converso merchants, long residents in England, openly declared themselves to be Jews. They no longer have to hide, they don't have to meet to Dobbin and you know someone's house. And in fact, Solomon Schultz dates from 1701, but there's a, a plaque on the uh, corner on a building, and that's where the first uh, Bedford March synagogue does have a Hebrew show. I know I was, everyone calls it Bedford March, but it does have some sort of Hebrew name, uh, was, was established, and that would have been in the 1650s. And then, Obviously, the community prospered as well, and, and that's when they built Marx's 1701. And I told you, because I'm always amazed, you know, everything in that show is original to 1701. I always find it was a little uncanny sitting on the bench there to think, oh my God, for hundreds of years, you know, people had sat on these benches. And my son, you know, in the men's section, there were like these cubbies underneath where people would kept kept their Arm, and he's found these old, old um, uh, scissorins. And you know how we have these, we bless the president, vice president of the United States, and they bless, uh, bless the king, you know. And he found one where they were blessing George III, who was you know, our protagonist during the American Revolution. <laughs> but it was, it was like so excited when, when, he, when he found this. I don't know if he has even more older ones than that, but I thought that was. That's kind of, uh, so he went, he doesn't do it anymore, but when he first came, so we had, um, I think on uh, July 4th, he made some sort of a thing, and, and the gathering came to the show, and he said it was for, in honor of the two Georges, <laughs> George, George Washington, <laughs> in honor of George the <laughs> Third. So, I thought that was kind of fun. Um, Okay, so I'll just finish up this. Over oh, the Jews, other conversos from Portugal, plus Dutch Jews, classified as merchants, entered the country without any hindrance. When Charles II, again, he's the steward of the new dynasty in England, was restored to the throne of England in 1660. Remember, Cromwell had already died in 1588. The situation underwent no change. That's it. They're already living there. They're part and parcel, you know, of the community. And no problem, we're not going to expel them at this point. They can just stay. Um, so underwent no change. Charles II's government was as anxious as Cromwell had been to outrival Holland in commerce. The presence of Jews was considered to be and truly proved to be quite useful for this purpose. A place was found suitable for worship and in 1701, Bevis Mark, a permanent synagogue was built. Apparently, there were a um, Oh, no, I'm thinking Holland. That's the only one. Okay. So, no, Bevis Mark, that is the oldest congregation in England. Jews could still not participate in government. Right? I told you they're not officially on the books that they live there or in any other part of official Jewish life because an oath was required, which only a Christian could take. 
but in economic life and even in society, they soon began to play an important part. Okay, so we, we finished by England. I was going to show you how the, how the two are combined. And now, how does Rabbi Menasseh Ben Israel get involved with this? What time is it? Should I? Um, well, officially, right, if I began at the border. Oh, F. Oh, you want me to just finish Rabbi Menasseh Ben Israel and then we can go on next time? So let's go. Um, okay, so on top of page seven. So I'm English, we're talking about Holland now, right? The Jews mm -hmm. of Holland on page seven of the top. Rabbi Manasseh's fame as a scholar spread beyond the confines of the Dutch Jewish community, and he communicated with many Christian theologians and scholars. It is said that Cromwell's interest in the official read mentioned Jews in England was kindled by the attention shown in Puritan circles to Rabbi Manasseh's work. So that's kind of interesting, you know, the connection with, with, with his writing. Esperanza de Israel, which I guess was a particular book talking about the Jews, Cromwell and the men in his circle had read familiar with. Among his non-Jewish friends was the famous artist Rembrandt Van Rijn, who made an etching of Rabbi Manasseh in which I don't know where what museum has it, but I see, I've, I've seen copies of this picture. Rembrandt even prepared the copper plate in 1657, illustrating some copies of one of Rabbi Manasseh's words. That's amazing, isn't it? It was a Spanish work on the meeting of Nebuchadnezzar's statue, as described in the book of Daniel, chapter three, and it's actually quite wondrous. I don't know if you ever read Daniel, but it's a very wondrous, Wondrous depiction that he's making actually a natural, you know, a engraving of, of, of as his interpretation of that. In Amsterdam in 1627, Rabbi Manasseh founded the first Jewish printing establishment in Holland. He used it to print all the Jewish literature needed by the community. So, so you know, you will often find certain uh, works, not necessarily Dutch Jewish works, but works. From other places, but they were printed in Amsterdam because there was this printing press. He used it to print all the Jewish literature needed by the community. The press employed a new typeface, which was later copied by many other European printing houses. I think I found that interesting. I don't know the name of the typeface, but uh, I read this. All right. This is in Holland. Look how rapidly this community has evolved and you know, established itself. In 1639, the three Sephardic communities in Amsterdam united to form the congregation of Ain Shalom. Shalom told me that's not right. <laughs> I guess it's from a, a bona fide Jewish history time. But Shalom says it was called Kahal Kadosh Talmud Torah. And Shalom would certainly know he's been there and he's a friend, you know, in, in that world. Uh, and who was their first? Rob, they designated Robert Shalom Mortera as. Wow. When I saw that name, Mortera, did you ever read the book about uh, the kidnapping of, I forget the child's name, Mortera in Italy? So I guess they're related. Somehow. You never read that book? It's amazing. It's true. I mean, this uh, Jewish child who was, uh, his, uh, and a servant in the house claimed she had, she had baptized the child when, when, he, when, when he uh, was little, he was ill. Uh, so then the Catholic Church sent out people to literally arrest the kid. They kidnapped, they kidnapped this little boy. He was about four or five years old uh, from his parents. Uh, he was raised in the Catholic Church. This is somewhat 19th century Italy. Man, 19th century Italy. I mean, getting in closer to modern time here. Any case, the name just struck me. You know, uh, and also this man right here, uh, who was the Rav and Rabbi Yitzhak Abohabda. He was the assistant rob. Rabbi Menasseh received a minor appointment in the newly formed Kahal, but he now found himself without an adequate means of livelihood. He decided to settle the new world business prospects of Thomas. I'm going to stop here because I found that so interesting. Can you imagine? I mean, he, didn't, he never went to the new world, but he was actually considering emigrating, you know, and settling down so he could somehow survive. Okay, just back to information I learned from Shalom. Okay, so he said every called that the Halkadosh Talmud Torah, that there were actually three shuls. Originally, one it was called 
Well, I had two nuclear. So it was either with Beit Shalom or Beit Yaakov. Then there was this Neve Shalom, all right? And then there was another one called Beit Yisrael. And they're the ones we're all going to combine to find. And if you were to go to Amsterdam today, that, I don't remember when that building, where that was, it's all so. So it's called the Esnoga, which means synagogue. That, but that's the, the, the Spanish Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam. And it was built in the year 1675. And Shalom Shalom number 1701. And it's the largest synagogue of that era. Can you imagine that it was considered the large? Have you, have you ever been to Amsterdam? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's a very impressive synagogue. But I remember going there um, with a friend that's on my way back from my year in Israel. I almost felt like crying. I mean, it's this huge place, probably see, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of people. And there's this, all, because they were all murdered by the Nazis. You know, I, again, I learned this from Shalom. I never realized that there's so many the books that I've read about Jews, you know, in Holland during the Holocaust. It's, they're more like Ashkenazi you know, background. But apparently it was an extremely large Spanish Portuguese Jewish community, and most of them were killed by uh, Hitler. So really, it was a beautiful, very vibrant you know, part of the world. Um, and they had four chandeliers. <laughs> Those have got no more you No, know, at least a hundred more. This one had a thousand candles from those four chandeliers. And uh, I remember when I was there, if they had, I don't think they had them all lit, even in Shalom Shul, they're not all lit. I mean, they did do light a portion, but like obviously, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, I mean, they like, you know, people sometimes rent. The place where they went weddings here because it's such a magical place, and then they'll light all the candles. I was there once when there was a wedding, Shalom was officiating at, and it was gorgeous, right? To see all, all those candles lit. Um, okay. Oh, and this Rabbi Isaac uh, Boab de Fonseca, he, he, he was the founder of that school, and apparently introduced the use of liturgical notation, although Trump has been around for a long time. But maybe the one that they daven, uh, if you ever go to New York City and daven in the Spanish Portuguese, I and mean, the davening is very different sounding. I mean, it took Shalom a while, but at this point, he was six years in Shevet Israel. I think he's in his seventh year. He can't even do the Ashkenazi thing anymore because he's, he's so much part and parcel uh, of his life now. And he knows when he lands, he, he's laying with, with that there. Trump, you know, but uh, and they're very diff different sounding. But again, they're nothing like the Spartan of like North Africa or the Middle East. I would say to me that they struck me more as being like German Jews. I remember years ago when Rabbi, oh, what was his name? Uh, in the Jewish Center in Manhattan, I know he took his a very sound, whatever. I found German Jews, I guess. The Jewish Center, uh, you know, they wear top hats, and so Shalom Shul is the same thing, you know. Anybody doing it in that fish, and if you go to Shei Israel, you also, and you're called up for an aliyah, you have to put a hat on, so that's a, so it's very formal, you know, and uh, you know, there's no carrying on, you know, like he, when he came to to visit me one time, so he thought, oh, I'll go to the Sephardic, you know, minion. Rocking and God knows, <laughs> and they're all carrying on and yelling out. And, you know, so yeah, that's not the this is very, very horrible, very distinguished, you know, kind of context. So next time we get together, we will finish up about the Jews in Holland. All right, again, in the 17th century. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. No, not at the time. He first his first job was in Lincoln Square Synagogue. He was assistant rabbi there, and then they were building their new building, and they wanted to conserve money, so they decided they didn't need an assistant rabbi. And then he was looking for another position, and then someone told him about well, Shevet Israel was looking for somebody. And he says, "Well, what's that?" He's like, I, I never, he never heard of it. So I said, "Oh my God, it's the oldest synagogue in America." I said, "Go for it." <laughs> So maybe I'm responsible for going to England. <laughs> right.
But he was the other thing he was concerning was some thinky little place in New Jersey. <laughs> he said, go to shame in Israel. Right. <laughs> yeah, oh, he's extremely happy there and you know, well respected. Very much so mm -hmm. like him. Oh yes. Oh, that sounds so familiar. Even I know that name. But Sean has only been there like seven years. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. I mean, I know I know that name. Right. Oh, he's probably in the Ashkenazi. Oh, oh I see. Well, he knew the guy who was in Marble Arch Synagogue. I know that. That's what I'm talking about. I'm just going to leave it. I can't, I can't figure out how to turn this off. Great to see. And thank you for coming. Oh, I know. 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 Thank you. 